Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Dr. Meyer. Can you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? It's Robert Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. And Dr. Meyer, what is your profession and where are you currently employed? I'm a uh, licensed clinical psychologist and I work at Mathers Clinic. And how long have you worked as a licensed clinical psychologist for? I was originally uh, licensed in 1983. And how long have you been practicing at the Mathers Clinic? Past 10 years. And it's my understanding, Your Honor, at this time that the state would stipulate that Dr. Meyer is a licensed clinical psychologist and is an expert in the field of forensic psychology. State? Yes. Stipulation allowed. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. You prepared a psychological evaluation of uh, Joanne Cunningham, is that correct? That is correct. And do you see Joanne Cunningham in court today? Yes, sitting in the orange jumpsuit. Your Honor, may the record reflected in court identification of my client, Ms. Cunningham. So noted. Thank you, Judge. And you completed the initial psychological evaluation on January 24, 2020? That's correct. And then you also prepared an addendum to that report dated July 9, 2020, is that correct? That's correct. For identification purpose, Your Honor, I'm showing the state by Mark that the defendant is moving to the one. I'm asking to admit at this time both the psychological evaluation and the addendum. State? Okay. Admitted? As well, Your Honor, I would like to admit Dr. Myers' CV as defendant's exhibit number two. State? No objection. Admitted. Thank you. Now, Dr. Monner, I want to turn your attention to your interviews with Ms. Cunningham. Do you recall those interviews? Yes, I do. And approximately how many times did you meet with Ms. Cunningham? Approximately three times. And where did you meet her? In the uh, <clears throat> examination room of the McKenna County Jail. And approximately how long were those interviews? Approximately an hour each time. And what else did you review in terms of documentation and presentation of your evaluations and for testimony for today? Um, I reviewed um, some reports we received, police reports. I, re I viewed some videos that were provided to me um, and <clears throat> some past medical records. And you indicated that you met with her three times, is that correct? That's correct. And what is the purpose of a psychological evaluation in these types of cases? In this particular case, it was uh, for the purpose of just trying uh, the best we can through the lens of social psychology or psychological principles to explain how a person could come to commit such an act, become the person they were, and what uh, psychologically may have been contributing to what occurred. And is there a clinical definition to this type of act that you refer to? It's, it's referred to as filicide. And what is the definition of filicide clinically? It's the murdering of, of, of a child by a mother. And so there could be neonatal natal or children, but filicide is when the, the victim is a child. And are there specific classifications, uh, classification system or types of filicide that are committed? Yes. the. Uh, Fortunately, the uh, base rate, so to speak, the occurrence of this in society is uh, relatively low, so low that you can't have uh, an actuarial predictive test, but there are typologies. There's typical typologies, and there's five basic typologies. And what are those typologies? If you can explain them to the court, please. Uh, altruistic, um, this would be... Um, a person, a mother who murders her child out of love, thinking they're doing something to protect a child. There's psychotic, where a person's getting some kind of command hallucination that makes absolutely no sense. Uh, there's what I'm referring to is a <clears throat> malignant neglect, just a pattern of abusive neglect over time that eventually leads to death. There's the uh, <clears throat> possibility of um, the unwanted child, this person doesn't want to be bothered, wants to get rid of the child. And the last type is a revenge, where a mother may kill a child to harm the father. Now, before we get to what classification Ms. Cunningham would fit, do you have prior experience in cases of filicide? Yes, I do. 
And what is your prior experience regarding cases of filicide? The first experience I had with this was in the early 80s. Uh, this was an altruistic filicide where a mother was getting command hallucinations through TV. Either killed or attempted to kill her children. I, at that time, I was working as a crisis worker at the so jail. And I, to Overruled. Go ahead. You can go ahead. Uh, I met her, and I entered in this case, and at that time I met the area expert, Dr. Vernon Tudor, who was the mental health director at Elgin State, who alleged his specialty to be that of murdering mothers, and I got to know him quite well. We discussed this thing, and from there on in my career, there's been several, several situations where I've evaluated postpartum depression uh, with women who have harmed, harmed or killed their children. I've treated women in the hospital who've had postpartum depression. And currently I do uh, evaluations for through UYSB but DCFS for uh, of mothers who have been founded on child abuse cases. So it's a regular part of my practice. Thank you. And going back to the classifications or the types of filicide, what classification would Ms. Cunningham be in your professional opinion? Maltreatment, malignant maltreatment, a pattern of abuse over time. And is it common in cases of filicide or child abuse for a parent to target one child over another child? Yes, it is. Uh, and why is that? There's a lot of explanations. It's referred to in the literature as uh, spurning. You, you find one child. And is that <clears throat> Maybe common? because uh, for some reason they've had some problem with attaching to that child child may remind them of somebody, some particular aspect that they direct their anger towards that one particular child. And in examining the case file and meeting with Ms. Cunningham, what did you discover throughout your interview with Ms. Cunningham that led you to your ultimate diagnosis? Well, uh, in terms of the uh, typology, Yes. Um, uh, it, she, the child was born exposed to opiates, so essentially abuse occurred at that period of time, taken away then. And then uh, as I read through the records, there's a pattern of repeated abuse all the way up to the death. Now, were you able to ascertain uh, what events, if any, occurred or transpired in Ms. Cunningham's childhood that uh, ultimately led up to this point? Uh, in my opinion, I think uh, there, there is <clears throat> the explanation has to do with her early childhood experiences of trauma. And what her, were those? In her, in her life. And what were those? An extended period of trauma, we used an instrument referred to the ACE, which is <clears throat> uh, that looks for uh, abuse or trauma that her, uh, occurs in childhood. This was a what is the ACE, Dr. Martin? The ACE is a um, Adverse Childhood Experience Inventory. And what, was, what does that do? Well, it was developed in the 80s. It's a very interesting study where they took a large sample of people and they used a correlation study to identify uh, 10 factors. They took those 10 factors and if a person had a score of four, and they followed these people longitudinally through their life, and it ended up people that had certain higher scores of four or more had a very high incidence of a variety of physical, social, addictive problems in, in leading up to early death. It, was, it, it had a strong predictive value. And then through the 80s, they've used the same sample and tested it out on a variety of populations. Uh, for example, one particular study that I talk about is the adult criminality and violence. And uh, people that score high on this later in life, it doesn't say they will, but have a higher probability of uh, violent acts. And what was Ms. Cunningham's score? She uh, came close to having a perfect 10 out of 10 in terms of this ACE inventory. And is this ACE inventory or the adverse childhood experience, experience is that uh, relied upon by forensic psychologists in formulating their opinion? In these yes, types of cases? it's relied upon by forensic psychologists, relied upon in courts, in domestic violence courts. It's relied upon in healthcare centers. It's, uh, it's used in a variety of situations. 
And what specifically did you learn from Ms. Cunningham's self-reporting about her childhood trauma? Well, if we, her earliest memory, she reported to me, was really her father beating up her maternal grandfather. Uh, her, her father being out of the picture, her mother remarrying, who she describes as uh, with the most vile of terms, being an addict, bringing different men in, not being there, being abusive to her and her brother. She goes on to state that in the eighth grade she was raped, and following the rape, she had a suicide attempt in the eighth grade, requiring hospitalization, at least having her stomach pumped. By her, by 15, she's uh, pregnant, uh, drops out of high school, um, and her mother uh, insists she has an abortion or she was going to prosecute her boyfriend at the time. She then moved in with this boyfriend who she stays with for a while who also becomes abusive. At age 18, the one person that she kind of clung to in life through all this trauma was her brother, and he uh, dies of an overdose. Was that by suicide, or was that an overdose? It, well, there was, it was by suicide. Uh, and did all those factors, did you use all those factors about her childhood trauma that you just testified to in ascertaining her score, I guess for lack of a better term, on the ACE instrument? Yes, I did. And again, it's your testified that she was almost a 10 out of 10 regarding that test That's or correct. instrument. That's correct. Now, transitioning over to her adult life, specifically her relationships, what did you learn from her self-reporting about her relationship history? The, uh, her ability to attach appropriately in relationships was highly disturbed. In what she, sense? She had... Uh, abuse in her first relationship. She then got married, said it was stable, but he would get out uh, intoxicated and became abusive, eventually breaking her ankle. And what was significant about her breaking her, her ankle? She was introduced to narcotics at that time. And what uh, narcotics? Norco, hydrocodone, the kind of narcotics for pain medications. And those are prescription opioids? That's correct. And did she report common normal use of those or was it abuse? She quickly began abusing them. I think her psychological makeup, the psychological pain that she experienced, she's attempted to deal with through denial and repression, to push it out. And of course, narcotics really can help that, to numb you from experiencing anything. And I think she just found that too attractive to stay away from. And did she end up uh, divorcing that ex-husband that had broken her ankle? Yes, she did. And what specifically transpired at that point? Did she meet anyone at that point? Yes. She, Who did she meet? She allegedly said it crying in the hallway in front of divorce court, an attorney approached her and said he would take on the case. And who was that attorney? Uh, Mr. Friend. And Andrew, that, Andrew, Andrew Friend? Friend? Yes. And what did you learn about Andrew Friend that, and how he met her and how that impacted her he, psychologically? He himself uh, was abusing drugs. He was 54, she was 29. Uh, I don't think his intentions were necessarily altruistic to help her. I think he wanted something more from it. And in fact, they ended up getting together, sexually involved, Speaking uh, of and sexual, doing drugs. I'm, I'm doing sorry. Drugs. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of sexual involvement with uh, Andrew Friend and Ms. Cunningham, how did Ms. Cunningham self-report their physical relationship and their relationship in general with one another, being Miss Cunningham and Andrew Friend. She told, she described it as disgusting. She didn't want it, but felt she had no alternative, so went with it. She needed somewhere to be. Um, she found him to be just absolutely a hollow person, not there, no, not connected in any way. That it all revolved around drugs. And why is that significant, if any reason? It's another indication of the uh, disturbances, one, in her relationships, the people she's with, two, the uh, ongoing feeling of abandonment and no support. And was there also, during her marriage with Andrew Friend, was there another relationship that was ongoing as well? Yes, there was. And was that with an individual by the name of Dan Nowicki? That's correct. And what was unusual about that ongoing relationship? 
with Dan Nowicki while she was married with Andrew Fred. Well, I found it unusual that they lived in the same house. They had a, a relationship together, all three of them. I don't. He tolerated and paid for it to a certain extent. Can you as, can as you though explain? as though he was ignoring really what was the dynamics of what was going on? For clarification, you said he paid. Be, Drew for, Andrew was paid for what? Hotel room at one time for, for them, whom? For Joanne and Mr. Nowicki. Uh, he allowed them, Mr. Nowicki and Joanne, to live in the same house with them. And what does that say about Ms. Cunningham's mental health? I have felt her, the, her personality character, her character of her personality is highly disturbed. Her object relations, that being how she feels about herself and others, is extremely disturbed. I think there's an underlying rage. I think there's a, a lack of being able to trust um, uh, and, and a great deal of pain. And that is emerged in almost every relationship she had. And was that prior to the death of her son? Yes. And that was ongoing for a long period of time? That's probably been going ongoing throughout most of her life. Now, you mentioned Ms. Cunningham's substance abuse history. What specifically, I guess, stuck out to you while uh, you were evaluating Ms. Cunningham? What stuck out to me is a couple of things. One, uh, she stated that she uh, was found in contempt, of, spent 30 days in jail, something to do with the divorce. you remember when that was? Uh, that would have been... In 2012, I believe. And was that uh, prior to her, her meeting Andrew Friend or after? That was after meeting Andrew Friend. Okay, and what was significant about her being incarcerated? While incarcerated, she alleges she met another female inmate who introduced her to heroin, and she began doing heroin while incarcerated. And about how much heroin did she self-report using, do you recall? At some point, she was using six bags a day of heroin, not while incarcerated, but after her release. And, and this was around the time that she was pregnant with AJ? That's correct. And did she maintain any sobriety, in your opinion? Well, not at the, after the child was born she was, and taken from her, that was her first rehab. And there may have been a, a period of sobriety a year or two after that. But sobriety, in her mind, is freedom from heroin. She was using other substances. What substances was she using? I believe at that time she was using Xanax and Adderall, and possibly Suboxone. I don't Suboxone may have come in later. And what is the significance, if any, of the use of Adderall, Xanax, opioids? How does that help well, formulate your opinion? As I viewed it, the real change in, in, change in her, she would use the opiates in it, numbed down the pain. It can, to some extent, helped her cope with all this inner turmoil in her head because she numbed herself to it. Once that was taken away and she began an Adderall, she didn't use Adderall as prescribed. She very quickly used it like an addict does. And when did she start using Adderall? Do you remember approximately what year that was? It, I believe she, at least 2012, it may have been even before that, there had been some use of it. Certainly was, uh, by 2015, she was using it, abusing it. And how much was she prescribed, do you recall? As best that I can call, recall, her prescription amount was somewhere between 20, 20 and 40 milligrams, which is and, an av average, normal. And how many times a day is that? One, once a day. And how much did she report using Adderall? By the time of the death, she stated she was up to 120 milligrams, if not more, every day. And why is that significant? It's, it's a terrible... Adderall's a, a Schedule II narcotic. Adderall's a stimulant. It's methamphetamine, basically. It deregulates a very delicate balance in the limbic system. And people who are abusing Adderall oftentimes become highly aggressive and have violent outbursts. And is that, that the limbic be, system it, that you mentioned, why is that significant that it alters the limbic system? The, the frontal cortex is, so to speak, the, this 
it becomes more complicated, but if you think about a car, that's the brakes. You have an emotion, and that part of your brain can kind of put the brakes on your responses. The limbus system is just raw emotion. She had no brakes. She just had the emotional action. She had no way of, she had lost the ability to control those impulses at times. And that is because of the abuse of Adderall? In my opinion, it, it had a lot to do with it. The abuse of Adderall was the fuel, the rocket fuel that lit the underlying personality and rage that had been buried throughout most of her life. And did Ms. Cunningham self-report to you while she was abusing Adderall changes in her personality? Yeah, she reported that she recognized something had changed and she had become a more angry, violent person. Other people around her began saying that to her, even Mr. Uh, Nowicki. And she actually indicated to you, and you, I believe wrote this in your report, that she was having episodes of rage. Yes. And anger. That's right. And in your expert opinion, what does Joanne's substance abuse illustrate in the overall picture? It was one of the pieces that led to this extreme violent rage episode. Um, it was, it was uh, the charge behind it. And after reviewing the case file that was presented to you, you also reviewed um, videos yes, of Miss Cunningham, and those videos contained her with AJ. That's right. And you were you reviewed those in preparation of your testimony today. Yes, I did. And do those videos depict an individual that, in your professional opinion, was? under the influence of controlled substance? The videos were uh, obviously horrible, uh, difficult to watch, very violent, very abusive. And um, even her appearance, her demeanor, her actions were very different from anything I had seen when she's not been on, on Adderall. And again, after reviewing all these documents and meeting with my client, what would your expert opinion be regarding the diagnosis of Joanne Cunningham? Well, I think uh, diagnoses are based on the DSM-5 and the ICD, and she meets the DSM-5 diagnosis. And what is the, I'm sorry. Well, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Is how, that's how we reach diagnosis. And when you say that's how we reach, that's... I'm psychologists and psychiatrists, mental health people. And that is relied upon by experts in your field? Yes, it is. Okay. And I think she meets the diagnosis under child uh, <clears throat> uh, abuse and neglect as child abuse confirmed, without question. I think, in my opinion, she has a cluster B personality disorder. What is that? That is a, a, a character disorder, a disorder of character that is including antisocial, narcissistic, and borderline, particularly borderline traits. Borderline traits are uh, people that seem, even without substance, they have impulse control problems, that have extreme emotional mood deregulation issues. She had that. And I would, she meets uh, stimulus uh, uh, abuse disorder, without question. And then it would be opiate abuse disorder as well, now controlled in a controlled environment. And would all these factors that you just testified to have an impact in her capacity or ability to deal with her son? Yeah, I think um, all th these things certainly had contributed to, to her inability to function in a, in a normal way. I may have a moment, Your Honor. You may. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. State by Mr. Keneally. Thanks. Cross. Hey, good afternoon, Doctor. How are you? Very good. Good. All right. So um, you did a report in this case. In fact, it was entered into evidence. Correct. Do you have a copy of your report? Do you need one? I have a copy. You do. All right. So the report is just sort of like a long form, your opinion of Ms. Cunningham's psychological profile, how that may have interacted with um, her home life to lead to AJ's death. Is that a fair way to put it? Yeah. Yes, right. it is. Is there anything you want to change in your report before we get started with cross-examination? Anything I want to change? 
Uh, or is there anything in there that's not relevant to your opinion today? Um, I don't believe so. All right. So you were you talked on direct examination about typology and the various types of uh, types that uh, uh, women that commit filicide can fall into. Where in your report do you talk about that? Either the first one or the second one. What? I don't believe I had that in the report. You didn't talk about that in the report. Right. Okay. Uh, you also talked about how how Adderall can. Um, we also talked about how Adderall can uh, affect or overcome the limbic system. I, I know that you did talk about Adderall, but did you ever talk about the limbic system in, in any of your reports? No, I did not. All right. And in any of your reports, did you did you indicate that she that you were going to diagnose her with this cluster B or antisocial personality disorder? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. So these are all new statements? Yes. Okay. So, and you knew that when you were creating your report that the defense, that the state, and that the judge was going to be relying on that report and sort of trying to understand what your opinion was? Well, I can't say I knew that was going to happen. I didn't really know the purpose of why they requested it. Okay. Now, you make some very um, specific and some very detailed statements about Ms. Cunningham's personality. So. Um, how do you have your pages numbered there, Doctor? Because I'm going to be referring to your report. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't number them. But so I started with page number one. Gotcha. And then I just went through, and so I see nine pages. Do you want to just take a second just yeah. to number it so you sure. can flip back and forth? Thank you. I'm ready. Okay, thanks. Uh, doctor, I'm on page 7, paragraph 3. Yes. Uh, personality pattern. So you say that her profile is suggestive of significant personality dysfunction. Ms. Cunningham's responses indicate that she has a strong, anxious need to conform to the expectations of others, but she anticipates criticism, derogation, and abandonment by those with whom she is close. She has a fear of expressing emotions and of losing control and maintains a facade of control, rigidity, compulsiveness, and defensiveness. Through this facade, she tends to deny or repress, and it goes on and on for the rest of the paragraph. So again, a very sort of nuanced understanding of the deepest, most intimate parts of her personality, but you only met with her three times, right? That's correct. And that's for a total of three hours? Correct. Okay. And you would agree that there's probably a lot about Ms. Cunningham's psychology and profile that you can't really ascertain in two to three meetings. Would we agree on that? Yes, I'd agree with that. Okay. And so much of your opinion is sort of to the best of your can, be, be, to the best of your knowledge, based on the limited information that you have, is sort of to speculate as to how this may have happened. That's correct. All right. And you don't object to the word speculate? No, I do. All right. Um, now, now, you would agree that there's uh, nothing about Ms. Cunningham's psychological profile, substance abuse issues, that would sort of fully explain or justify what she did? Nothing justifies what she did. All right, so you, let's just go through your sources of data. So I've just got your report here, and I'm on page one. So the first thing that you did was a clinical interview and mental assessment, uh, and that was sort of the three meetings. That's correct. All right. Uh, and then you did a million clinical multi-axial inventory. Is there an acronym for that? or do you just The Milan and CMCMI. The MCMI, okay. Um, and then you did the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Is there an acronym for that one? Or is MMPI. MMPI, thank you. Uh, you did an adult life history questionnaire? Correct. Okay. And, and what does that entail? Uh, that's a social history that she fills out talking about her life, basically. Okay. And then there's the Rotter's incomplete sentence Correct. blanks. And that's sort of like a written Rorschach test almost. Like she, you say, like the sentence starts with I feel, and then she sort of feels in the blank. Or I regret, and she feels she feels in the blank, right? That's correct. All right. So j just with regard to all these sources, so all of the information that you use to make your assessment with regard to the clinical interview, the MCMI, the MMPI, all of that information was provided by the defendant. That's correct. Right? Okay. Uh, she could have lied to you. She could have given you inaccurate information. Is that true? That is true. Okay. And of course, you would agree that had the defendant lied to you and provided you with inaccurate information, that would, have under, that would sort of undermine your results. That would undermine your opinion. That's correct. Okay. Um, 
and we know sort of going through some of the other things that you reviewed. So for example, you reviewed the Gottlieb Memorial Hospital records, right? Correct. So we know from going through those that she's not exactly George Washington in that she lies. Correct. Okay. Uh, and you learn going through the Gottlieb medical records that she was woken up by the police in North Lake uh, after passing out, right? That's correct. All right, and she was brought to the hospital with visible track marks on her arm, right? Correct. And there was medical staff, and you consider yourself sort of medical staff, right? Correct. So there was medical staff such as yourself there, and she told them that she didn't use heroin, right? Correct. All right, and she lied to them. Yes. All right, and in addition to lying, she also refused to provide blood or urine that could verify or not verify whether or not she had lied, right? That is correct. All right, and you also read the Crystal Lake Police and the FBI records, right? Yes, I did. And you're aware that she was interviewed twice by, uh, once by the Crystal Lake Police and once by the FBI, right? That is correct. And you're aware that she lied to the Crystal Lake Police as well as the FBI about not knowing where AJ was? That's correct. She lied about not killing AJ? That's correct. She lied about not having abused AJ prior to his death? Correct. All right, and there was a lot of like intentional and premeditated lying. And what I mean by that is it appears as though she had thought out these lies and conspired with defendant friend to tell the same lies. Uh, that could be. I'm not quite sure on that, but I know she lied. All right, are you aware from the Crystal Lake Police Department that she was sort of performative in her <laughs> lie in that she went to the gas station to ask people that morning, like, has anybody seen AJ? Correct, yes. Okay. So you would agree with me that the defendant is a manipulative person? Yes, I would. All right. Um, and you, you mentioned, and the point of all of this lying, okay, the point of all of this lying to the Crystal Lake Police Department as well as to the people at Gottlieb Hospital, well, that was to sort of protect herself from the, protect herself from the legal consequences of the truth. That's right. Now, you mentioned that Ms. Cunningham indicated that she was raped. That's right. All right. Now, you, you also talked about how you had sort of looked at those unpleasant videos of her... Right, you looked at those unpleasant videos of her in, in, uh, screaming and interacting with AJ when AJ appears very hurt. Yes, I did. Okay, uh, I, I don't see it here, but did you uh, did, did you have a chance to review the um, tapes where she was talking with Brad Edwards, who asked her, "Did anything bad sexually ever happen to you?" And this was on May fourth of twenty nineteen, and her response was no. Did you ever have a chance I, to listen to those tapes? Is, was it, if that was during the the interrogation. No, that would have been uh, a jail phone call, May 4th. I did, um, not, I did not see okay, that. Okay, there was a May 6th, 2019 tape while she was speaking with Brad Edwards of ABC News. He asked, has anyone ever sexually abused you? Her response was no. Did you have a chance to, to look at those? I didn't see that. Okay. Um, and then, so speaking of, of lies, we're, let's go to the MMPI. Yes. All right. Uh, you actually weren't able to get a result from this test. Is that correct? That's correct. And would you just tell the judge what the MMPI is? It's, it's a, an objective psychological inventory that compares her response to known psychiatric patients, and then you get a, a clinical profile as to their personality functioning or psychological problems. All right, and I'm on page 8, uh, paragraph 6 of your report. Yes. All right. Uh, you weren't able to get a result from this test because you said the defendant responded in a, quote, exaggerated manner, endorsing a wide variety of extreme symptoms and attitudes. Is that correct? That's correct. So in other words, she's trying to make it appear as though she has psychological symptoms that she actually doesn't have. She was certainly exaggerating symptoms that appeared on that test. Okay, so she wasn't being entirely forthright. She wasn't being entirely honest with that was the Yeah, that's what the validity scale suggests. Let's talk about the MCMI. And again, and I'm on, let's see, what page seven. is that on, doctor? Can you help me? Seven. Page seven. Seven, yes. All right. Um, and again, you, you, you found in that test as well, though you were able to get a result, you also found that she tended to over-report her symptomology, right? That's correct. And that's just a fancy way of saying she's exaggerating again. She's not being entirely forthright. Correct. All right. So you had talked earlier about the DSM, right? Yes. Right. And the DSM you recognize as an authoritative um, treatise in the field of um, psychology? Yes, I do. All right. I'm holding what I've marked as People's Exhibit 27. And, Judge, I'm approaching. I didn't ask. May I approach? Uh, you're right on 27, and you may approach. Thank you. I'm going to just you. tender that to you. So Dr. Turn with me, well, first of all, do you recognize what that is? Yeah, this right. is. Is that the DSM? Yes, it is. All right. 
and that's a DSM-5, that's like the most current model. That's sort of like the Bible, like everything for psychology you test against yes. the DSM, right? That's right. Okay. Um, 726. Uh, Page 726? Yeah, 726 if you would, doctor. Yes. All right. Bottom of that page, malingering. Yes. What's the definition? Malingering is, uh, well, I'll read it to you from here. The, essen the essential feature of malingering is the uh, intentional production of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms motivated by external incentives such as <clears throat> avoiding military duty, avoiding work, obtaining financial compensation, evading criminal prosecution, or obtaining drugs. Okay. Let's and then there's... stop right here. Um, are there, is there any objection to the court taking judicial notice of this learned treatise, or is it going to be introduced into evidence? I'm not going to introduce it into evidence, Judge. I'm just going to use it for purposes of cross-examination. Well, then the issue is, uh, why is he reading from it if it's not introduced into evidence? It's, it just go, it goes to the it goes to the nature of his it goes to the nature of his diagnosis. He's acknowledged that this is an authoritative treatise that the, that the material in there is authoritative. He's made certain psychological he's made certain. Um, um, psychological diagnoses, and I'd like to test that against some of the other diagnoses. Defense? All right, go ahead. All right, and then the DSM, there's um, certain criteria for when you should strongly suspect whether or not somebody's malingering, right? Correct. All right, and the first one is medical, and I'm quoting, medical legal context of presentation, e.g., the individual is referred by an attorney to the clinician for examination, or the individual self-refers while litigation or criminal charges are pending, right? Correct. Okay, that's a check, right? Correct. All right. And the second one is a marked discrepancy between the individual's claimed stress or disability and the objective findings and observations, right? Correct. And we kind of have that here, going back to the MPMI, as well as the... Um, What's the other one, Doctor? As well as the, the MCMI, in that she's sort of over report. There's a discrepancy between what the results of those tests say and what she's reporting, right? Correct. Okay, so that's a check. Correct. All right. Um, and then number four is presence of antisocial personality disorder, which you talked about on direct examination she may have. Correct. Okay, so based on the DSM, malingering should be strongly suspected in this case when she was talking to you. Is that fair to say? Well, <laughs> malingering of child abuse confirmed is confirmed. Okay. Similar abuse, there's no is confirmed, and and the personality sort of antisocial is consistent with a liar. So uh, the possibility for I don't the other part of malingering is for some gain, and I don't see how my report benefit her in, in any manner. Well, well, why don't we talk about that, doctor? I mean. You, you understand that the purpose of a sentencing hearing is for the judge to hear evidence in aggravation and mitigation, right? Correct. Okay, and you were called to provide, you weren't called to provide evidence in, in aggravation, right? Correct. Okay, and you certainly understand the general premise that the more somebody is sort of suffering from psychological, diffi di psychological difficulties or disorders, some might say they're less culpable for their crime. I suppose. Okay. Now, I'm going to refer you to page 7, paragraph 3. Of my report? Yes, yes, sir. And this is your first report. Okay. I'm there. All right. And you say that, and so this is, so these are, so what you're talking about here is the million clinical multiaxial inventory and the results of that test, right? That's correct. Okay. And the results of that test, and you relied on that test in order to formulate your diagnosis. Yes, I did. Okay. And the results of that test were based on that test, you were able to glean that she has a strong and anxious need to conform to the expectations of others, right? Correct. Okay. Well, you would agree that others would expect her not to use and abuse heroin, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, you would agree that others would expect her not to use heroin while pregnant? Correct. Okay. You would agree that others would not expect her to use or abuse heroin while she's taking care of children? Correct. All right. You would agree that others would expect her not to beat her son to death, right? Correct. Okay. So she didn't exactly conform to the expectations of others based on your test, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, again, you also talk about, uh, I'm on page 7, paragraph 3, beneath this controlled facade are feelings of insecurity that surface in the form of self-blame and self-punishment, right? Correct. Okay. 
Well, when talking about AJ, um, she described him according to you. On page four, paragraph seven, she said that AJ was difficult from birth, right? Correct. She talked about how he never listened, right? Correct. She talked about how he stole, right? Correct. She said that he was a very defiant and oppositional child, right? Correct. All right. She said that she described AJ as doing a lot of bad things, right? This is uh, page four, excuse me, this is the bottom of page four of your report. Correct. All right. She said he would steal money. Correct. Ms. Cunningham reported to you that he would break stuff. Correct. Sneak out of his room. Right. Wouldn't listen. Correct. Always had to have his way. Correct. All right. So in your report, she didn't really seem to have any problem assigning blame to AJ. No. Okay. And nowhere in your report did she explicitly or verbally blame herself for AJ's behavior, right? That's correct. Okay. And nowhere in her report did she ever say anything nice about AJ, did she? No, she did not. All right. So she never said that he was handsome. No. She never said he was uh, good at Legos. No. Never said he had a good sense of humor. No. Never said he was a good big brother. No. And you never met AJ, right? I did not. And you have no idea what kind of kid AJ was? No, I don't. And you acknowledge that she could have been lying to you about AJ, right? Correct. Okay. So, let, so let's just say that she was telling you the truth, all right? The, the fact that she was using and abusing heroin while she was pregnant with AJ could that explain maybe some of his behavior problems? Is it possible? Um, well, it's possible. Um, I mean, um, I don't know if AJ was ever diagnosed with any condition himself. Okay, well the fact that she was abusing benzos, amphetamines, and opiates while she was supposed to be caring for AJ, might that explain some of the behavior problems? It, it certainly could affect AJ's brain chemistry and his behavior and defiance. It could. The fact that AJ was isolated from other children, hadn't seen a doctor in over two years, didn't seem to have really any friends. Might that explain some of AJ's behavior problems? Yes. All right. The fact that he was locked in a room for prolonged periods of time, might that explain some of AJ's behavior problems? Certainly. All right. And the fact that he was subject to intense and ongoing abuse, if it's true that AJ had these behavior problems, might that explain some of them? Certainly. Now, Doctor, you also diagnose um, the defendant with, with major depressive order, and you also diagnose her with generalized anxiety disorder. Is that correct? Is that on the last page? Yeah, I believe that's your, I believe that is, um, it was in your first report, Doctor? I don't know the exact All right. I, uh, yeah, at the time of interviewing, we felt she was suffering from major depression and anxiety. Okay. Um, and so just looking at, at major depressive disorder, mm -hmm. um, she was, that's sort of somebody's in a depressed mood most of the day. That's right. Right? Significant weight loss might be a thing, slowing down of thought and reduction of physical movement, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness, et cetera. Those, that kind of explains it? Correct. Okay. Generalized anxiety disorder, excessive anxiety or worry, difficult to control worry, restlessness or feeling keyed up or on edge. That's correct. Okay. Um, it, it, but aspects or criteria of these two disorders don't include likelihood to engage in violence, right? That's correct. All right. Doesn't include uncontrolled rage. That's correct. Okay. Um, and just talking about these disorders, a, a, a tragic, life-changing event could bring about major depressive order, could bring about anxiety disorder. Yes, it could. Okay. Um, so if you've done something horrible that perhaps you have extreme guilt about, that could actually induce major depressive disorder as well as anxiety disorder, right? That is correct. If there's been significant changes in your life circumstances, for example, you're put in jail for a prolonged period of time, that could induce or bring about major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder. That is correct. All right, and you did not interview Ms. Cunningham in April of 2019 when this crime was committed. You interviewed her over a year later, right? That is correct. All right, you have no idea whether or not she was suffering from anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder in April of 2019, right? Yes. At the time of my evaluation. All right, so let's talk about the, the Adderall and the rage. Yes. All right? Um, so you, according to her, um, she started reporting having rages in 2017, right? That's correct. And she was actually very specific about the date. She said that her personality began to change in December of 2017, right? That's correct. So prior to that, her personality had not changed caused by the Adderall abuse, according to her. According to her. Okay. Um, and she was initially prescribed Adderall by a physician in 2017. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Now, did did she complain to her physician about the side effects of, of Adderall? Uh, I highly doubt that she was abusing it and buying it on the street to supplement it. 
Well, did you ever, as part of preparing your opinion here today, did you ever talk to her doctor that had prescribed her Adderall? No, I did not. Did you review any of her medical records wherein she was prescribed Adderall for what, why, when, how much she was taking? I did not see those. Okay, so all of her reports of Adderall, that's based on what she told you? That's correct. All right. Uh, and she wasn't, and, and what she reported to you was that she was actually abusing Adderall, is that correct? Yes. So not only was she getting prescribed Adderall, but she was also buying Adderall off the street, right? Correct. All right. And had she been taking Adderall within sort of the therapeutic ranges of her doctor, she likely wouldn't have suffered from these ranges. Uh, yeah, if she had been taking it as prescribed, we most likely would not have seen these adverse side effects. Okay. Um, so, so again, uh, December 2017 is when her personality changes, but she was abusing Adderall well in advance of 2017, right? It's, it's, uh, we try to put that together. As you mentioned, there's some maybe manipulative or lying or forgetfulness of when heroin was being abused, when cocaine was being used, when ecstasy was being used, when Adderall was being used. It's, it, it was very hard to get a, a real uh, accurate time frame. Well, I'm on page three, uh, paragraph one, two, three, four. And she would, it seems, she seems to indicate, uh, as stated, she was on Adderall and Norco, Mr. Friend was on cocaine, right. and this is on about the time that she moved into his house in 2012, right? So she was abusing Adderall as far back in, as 2012. It could be. All right. But between 2012 and then conveniently, December 2017, no change to her personality. As far as she self-reports, true. Okay. Uh, are you aware that in December of 2013, which you should be because you reviewed the Chris Lake Police Department, the Chris Lake Police reports, that she was charged with domestic battery? Correct. Okay, and she pled guilty to a reduced charge? Correct. Okay, and that could have been caused by anger or rage? It certainly was, I'm sure. All right. And did you have a chance to review the divorce finding where in 2012 a divorce court made the finding that the defendant has been guilty of, quote, repeated acts of physical violence, including bodily harm and acts that endanger life or limb? That would have been in 2012. Were you aware of that? I, didn't, I did not see that. Okay, but we both agree that 2012 is well, in, is well before December of 2017 where she reports these personality changes, right? Correct. All right. And since you reviewed the Chris Lake Police Report, you are aware that in October of 2017, James Rossow, a neighbor, reported seeing AJ with a number of injuries and bandages all over him, right? That's, that's correct. And you and I would both agree that October of 2017 is before December of 2017, where supposedly she had this change in her personality and became violent. Correct. Okay. And she blames a lot of her bad choices on, on drugs, right? Um, I would say that she would do that, yes. Yeah, so for example, on page four, five of your report, when asked why she wanted a family with Dan Nowicki, she stated, quote, I don't know why Dan, probably because of the drugs. Correct. Okay. When asked why she began sleeping, I'm on, I'm on page uh, three, paragraph four, when asked why she began sleeping with defendant friend in 2012, uh, though she was disgusted by his, by his request, she said, I don't know, probably because of the drugs. Correct. And, and this Adderall rage that sort of changed her limbic system and, uh, and I guess she wasn't able to put the brakes on of her rage, it's interesting though because you have no evidence that any of this rage, aggression, or violence was geared toward anybody else in the world other than AJ. Well, now that you pointed out the domestic violence, I guess so there is a... After time. December 2017 when she suffered oh, these changes. right, correct. Okay. Uh, hatred. That can cause a person to oh, act yes. with aggression and violence. Anger can cause a person to act with aggression and violence, right? Correct. Correct. Frustration, perhaps the regular frustrations of caring for a child, that in addition to Adderall can cause a person to act with violence. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Lack of human empathy, that's certainly something that can contribute to violence. Absolutely. And you would agree with me that, that Adderall use is pretty common, right? Yes. All right. Um, in fact, it's, it's also one of the pharmaceutical drugs that's kind of regularly sought out by drug abusers. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, and you would agree with me that sort of the vast majority of people using or even abusing Adderall, just the vast majority of people don't commit child abuse, right? That, that's correct. Okay. And you would certainly agree with me that the vast majority of people using and even abusing Adderall uh, don't murder their children. 
That's correct. Okay. And you would agree with me that, that Adderall doesn't fully explain what Ms. Cunningham did. That's correct. Right? And you would certainly agree that Adderall does not justify what Ms. Cunningham did. I would agree with that. All right, now you talk about this ACE score. Yes. And you say it's a, it's interesting test, but essentially it's just a, like a 10 question survey, right? That's right. All right, so like the first question is, did a parent or an adult in the, in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down, humiliate you, right? That's right. Okay, and she either answers yes or no. Correct. All right, and it's not like you went and verified whether or not she was abused as a child, right? That's, that's true. Okay. Uh, and you also are relying on what, she, on what her understanding of the word often is. Correct. Okay. Um, and and you, what you say in your report is you sort of say clearly Ms. Cunningham was subject to abuse, but I, I wonder if that is so clear. Did, did, did you ever, I mean, you, you, we, we've, there's been some, some very public and, and terrible statements made about Ms. Cunningham's stepmother mother and stepfather. Did you at any time ever call them and give them a chance to tell their side of the story to factor into your report? No, this is all based on her self-reporting. All based on her self-reporting. Did you ever talk with anybody else that may have known her growing up, anybody else in her family? No. Now you, now you talk about antisocial personality disorder? Yes. All right, and, and you think she has antisocial personality well, I, I, disorder? I feel she's in the cluster B, and that's part of it. I think there are antisocial personality just features there. All right, well, let's take a look. Uh, would you turn with me to 659 of the DSM? Yes. Okay. All right. So, and, and antisocial personality disorder, that those types of people, sociopath is kind of an anachronism. Would you agree? Like, there's no diagnosis for sociopath. The only, yeah, sociopath would fall under antisocial in this. All right, and what sociopath means is they just, they, they can't empathize with other people. So, or am I missing, is there other features of it? Well, uh, they, they're they completely self-centered and they take what they want, fundamentally. Um, so I'm just looking at the diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder. Mm -hmm. A is a pervasive pattern of disregard for the violations of the rights of others uh, occurring since age 15 as indicated by three or more of the following. And mm -hmm. The first one is failure to conform to the social norm with respect to lawful behaviors as indicated by repeatedly performing acts that are grounds for arrest. Check. Yes. Deceitfulness as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliases, or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. Check. In terms of deceitfulness. Correct. Okay. Uh, impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Correct. Okay. Irritability and aggressiveness as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults, right? Correct. Check. Reckless disregard for the safety of self or others. Check, right? Correct. Consistent irresponsibility as indicated by repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior or honor financial obligations. You, were you aware that she wasn't working at the time that this happened? She yes. Was in serious I debt. I mean, that's probably a check as well, right? Correct. Okay, lack of remorse is indicated by being indifferent or rationalizing, having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another person. We already talked about she never expressed any regret or remorse to you, right? Correct. Check. Uh, the individual is at least 18 years old. Check. Correct. Okay, there's been evidence of conduct disorder with the onset before the age of 15. Conduct disorder means problematic behavior, right? Correct. Okay, so we know that she ran away from home when she was a kid, right? That's right. Pregnant at 15, apparently had an abortion, Correct. according to her, uh, depressed prior to eighth grade. Correct. So that's a check, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it seems like she very well may have antisocial personality disorder. That's why we put her in, as you see here, above a cluster B. Okay. I think she also has the characteristics, some of the other characteristics as well in this category of personality dysfunction. What's the cure for antisocial personality disorder? Age. Okay, and there is some evidence that the symptoms reduce with age, but they don't entirely go away. That's correct. Right? So she's going to be a danger to herself or others it, to an enhanced degree for the rest of her life. Um, she would carry this personality disorder, correct? Okay. Moment, please, Judge. Sure. Nothing further, thank you. Redirect? Briefly, Your Honor. Dr. Meyer, as a licensed clinical psychologist, when a client comes to you or a patient, 
comes to you for assistance, they self-report what they're feeling in order for you to ascertain a diagnosis, correct? That's correct. And in general, you don't go and do independent research to find out if that individual is malingering or lying, correct? That's generally true. And in cases where an individual is abusing narcotics, controlled substances, like Adderall, uh, benzodiazepines, opioids, they tend to lie more often than not, correct? They're liars. But when you met Ms. Cunningham on those three occasions, you testified that she was in custody, correct? That's correct. And she was not taking any controlled substances while she was in custody, correct? Correct. And she wasn't taking heroin while she was in custody, correct? I don't think she was. She, at one time she said she was. Her, but during this, your three yes. interviews? Yes. I, no, I don't believe she was. In your three interviews of Ms. Cunningham while she was in the McHenry County Jail, did she seem under the influence to you? No, she did not. Have you seen individuals under the influence before? Yes. And you've been practicing in the, your field for over 30 years, correct? That's correct. And besides Mr. Keneally's diagnoses, you testified as to this lack of, of empathy, correct? Correct. And part of her diagnosis of Ms. Cunningham was that she has narcissistic personality disorder, or she's a narcissist as well. That's right. And a narcissist is one that lacks empathy, correct? Correct. So your testimony here is not to make excuses about what had transpired, correct? Absolutely, that's correct. You came here to testify as to what had transpired throughout her life. That's correct. I came here just to testify as the underlying personality, which is that cluster B, which would in and of itself suggest she's a manipulative, lying person that has trouble being honest, straightforward, or trusting me or anyone else. No reason to think she would be straightforward. But it confirms the underlying problem. Which is what? This extremely disturbed personality. And in the particular case with AJ, that being AJ taken away right at birth, she had trouble with attachment anyways. And the bonding between a mother and child, in my opinion, was disruptive even more. She never got that. It never happened. So when you combine all those factors, and as you testified, the Adderall abuse, the 120 milligrams of abuse was rocket fuel. That's what I would say. Yes, I believe that's true. Nothing further, Your Honor. Rick Cross? Nothing, Judge. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor. You can step down. Thank you.
telling you. A laundry basket with little boy clothes in it. That's cool. That, that's very cool. I don't know if we have my helmet. For them. I don't care a chopper anymore. Chopper left during the good stuff. Yeah, I might as well wait to do my teas because, like, it smells like stupid, right? What is it? Yeah, um, it'll, it won't. Well, it's, it's going to be gone. I can just pan the camera this way. So I would do that first. Just so you don't see the house. Yeah. Let's just wait five minutes. It's fine.